Hello, and welcome to The Lee Enoch Show, America's most controversial podcast. On today's episode, Lee brings in another special guest to discuss everything going on in the political landscape at the moment. Lee, what do you got for me today? Well, we're so honored to have Dr. Walter Block, uh, one of America's uh, leading libertarian economist and uh, I would say philosopher um, in the United States. Uh, before we get into that, he needs to tell us more about his high school experience with Bernie Sanders. I mean, that's, that's a phenomenon to me that you went to high school and the first two years of college with, uh, at what, Brooklyn College? Is that, is that correct? Uh, four years of high school and one year of Brooklyn College. And then after that, Bernie went off to the University of Chicago to finish his undergraduate degree. And I stayed at Brooklyn College. Unbelievable. So what was Bernie Sanders like in high school? Was he a socialist back then? Was he? Was, did you see some of the same traits that he is in now? I know he's a really very dedicated person to his causes. Right? Was he like that back then? Yeah, uh, he, he was a leader. He had a lot of presence. Uh, he was the, I think, the captain of the track team. We were both on the track team together. Uh, my joke about this is that um, Bernie Sanders uh, doesn't run away from much of anything. He didn't run away from socialism, even when socialism wasn't as popular as it is now, uh, in thanks in large part to his efforts. He doesn't run away from uh, not only ex-convicts voting, but actual convicts who are still in jail. He wants, <laughs> he wants them to vote. Uh, however, there is one person from whom he does run away, and that's me. Why? Because he was one of the best runners in, in Brooklyn uh, when we were on the track team together, and we ran in the same uh, uh, events, uh, half mile and, and mile and uh, cross country, two and a half miles. And I was a mediocre runner. So when we started off, we were at the same starting line, and then the gun went off, and he ran away from me. Oh. So uh, he, he runs away from me, but very few other people and very few uh, of his own ideas. Well, we're so thankful to have you on here. You know, I've uh, paid attention to you since you have um, came and spoke to us at Princeton. Um, I was part of the Princeton Libertarian Club. Um, it was a mixture of Princeton University students and students from Princeton Theological Seminary. And some of my friends wonder, how can I be such a friend to an atheist uh, libertarian scholar like Walter Block? What they don't know is that libertarianism has a strong influence in the conservative movement that were that I've been a part of most of my life, you know, low taxes, minimal government. These are principles uh, that we derive from libertarianism. I mean, all my life I've had libertarian views. I just didn't know it until I kind of encountered you, Walter, that, I mean, I just very limited. I mean, for, for example, um, I remember when George W. Bush announced that we're going to go to war against uh, Iraq on the basis of weapons of mass destruction. I was the only person amongst my friends going, okay, now explain this again to me. We're now what, what? Cause I'm thinking, you know, I, I had kind of non-interventionist, you know, ideas even back then, you know, this is like 20 years ago. I'm thinking, I, I need to see this again. This just doesn't make sense. We're going to go over there and launch this massive war for what reason now? And it turned out that, you know, I started listening to Ron Paul around that time. Now, I knew about Ron Paul because he ran for president in a libertarian ticket in 1988. And uh, so, you know, periodically Ron Paul would pop up in the news and stuff like that. But I I definitely was in the, I guess, the libertarian wing, if that's, or the liberty wing of the Republican Party all my life. And then when, for, for me, it was actually uh, Rand Paul that kind of led me to start looking into what you're believing because Ron Paul was a little too much out there for me. You know, Rand Paul was digestible for me as a, in a Republican Party. Um, he, he, you know, he wasn't as pronounced as libertarian as, as his dad, but he definitely had like a non-interventionist streak. So, Walter, tell us, um, I mean, how did you go from basically – being at going to high school with uh, Bernie Sanders to you basically you somehow came in contact of Ayn Rand and you became this like massive libertarian proponent. How did all this happen? 
Well, Bernie and I had roughly the same views. I'm Jewish. We were in Brooklyn in, in the 50s and the 40s, and everyone was a lefty, uh, uh, I don't know, pinko, uh, whatever you call it, uh, progressive, um, liberal, socialist. And um, I went to Brooklyn College. I was a sophomore, I think, and this is in the early 60s. And Ayn Rand came to a lecture at Brooklyn College, and I came to boo and hiss her. Now, in those days, when you booed and hissed, you didn't try to cancel. You didn't try to drown them out. It was sort of polite booing and hissing, you know, just a little bit to show uh, disagreement. And I was a socialist like Bernie. My views were roughly the same as his. He was much more into it than I. I was more into, I don't know, girls and sports in those days. Uh -huh. He was really uh, into politics then. Uh, and I came to, you know, uh, show my disapproval of Ayn Rand because she favored free enterprise. And everyone knows that free enterprise is really fascism and everyone will starve and everyone will die. And it's just horrible. Uh, after her lecture, uh, they announced that there was a, uh, a, a, a lunch in Harana put on by the Ayn Rand Study Club. I forget if that's the next uh, the exact right name, but it's something like that. And I came to the lunchroom where they were having the lunch and Ayn Rand was sitting at the head of the table. It was a long, long table, maybe 50 people on each side. And the only seats uh, were, that were empty were at the other end of the table from her. And I sat down there and I turned to my neighbor and I said, you know, let's debate socialism and capitalism. Socialism is the way to go. Capitalism is evil. And I said, well, I don't really know all that much about it, but the people who do are at the other end of the table. And there was Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon and Leonard Peikoff and Alan Greenspan and all of her uh, senior collective. And I uh, stuck my head in between Ayn's and Nathan's. I was maybe 20 years old and uh, Brandon maybe 35 and Rand maybe 50 or 55. And I said, there's a socialist who wants to debate someone on socialism and capitalism. And they said, who? And I said, me. And Brandon was very nice. He said, um, well, you know, there's no room at the this end of the table, but I'll come to the other end of the table and talk to you uh, on two conditions. One, you don't allow this conversation to lapse. You uh, continue it with me until we settle it. And secondly, you read two books that I'll recommend. And the two books were Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand and Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. And I uh, talked to him and I read the books and um, I was knocked over on my socks because I had never had anything like that. My education up until that point had nothing from free enterprise. It was all, you know, pinkoism or something. I, I read um, economics in one lesson. It blew me away. I read the entire Atlas Shrugged in one weekend. I couldn't put it down. I still regard this as my favorite uh, novel, uh, my favorite fiction work. And then I went to his house and uh, Rand's house. So four or five, six, seven, eight times. Uh, I went with my roommate, Ben Klein, who was a distinguished professor of economics at UCLA. And I was converted. I was now, a, I, I never really got the Randian thing. I, I didn't understand and, and wasn't interested in and disagreed with epistemology and metaphysics and aesthetics. and But the economics, I really liked. And she was a big fan of Ludwig von Mises. So, you know, how, how bad could she be? She was very, very good. Uh, but they were sort of cultish. Uh, you ask a, a nice question and she would give a good answer uh, when, when she was on stage. You ask a, a challenging question and she would kick you out. It was very cultish. But I didn't know any other people, so I would sort of stick it out for six months, and then I would leave, and uh, then I'd come back. I had a sort of a schizophrenic uh, uh, bipolar existence here. You know, I, I was uh, with the Randians and then against them. And then finally what happened is I met Larry Moss, who was a fellow student of mine at Columbia. I was getting my Ph.D. then. And he and his roommate, Jerry Wallows, ganged up on me and said, you've got to meet this guy, Murray Rothbard. He's an anarchist. And I said, anarchist, that's crazy. I don't want to meet an anarchist. So I wouldn't, I refused to meet Murray Rothbard. But finally, they ganged up on me. They got me to meet Murray and he converted me to anarchism in about 10 minutes using Hen Henry Hazlitt's economics. Henry Hazlitt uh, was not an anarchist, but he would say, well, why do we need a post office, a monopoly government post office? Wouldn't it be better if we had two or three competing post offices? And Murray said, well, why couldn't we do that with courts? Why couldn't we do that with police and armies? 
And I was then converted to my present position of uh, anarcho-capitalism. Now, to answer your question about um, uh, conservatives and libertarians, you know, uh, there are some groups where the two get along very well, uh, like the Federalist Society. It's, uh, I would say, half libertarian and half conservative. And, and they focus, you know, think of a Venn diagram where conservatives and libertarians overlap. And there is an overlap, uh, 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 certainly on, on economics, against unions, against minimum wage, against socialism. Uh, of, of course, libertarians also overlap with liberals on the left in case, uh, for example, uh, try to legalize um, uh, drugs, legalize um, uh, consensual sexual uh, behavior, prostitution, which doesn't mean that we favor these things. We just favor the legalization of these things. So I regard you... Um, as a uh, really as a libertarian, not a conservative, because conservatives who are anti-war and who want to legalize um, prostitution, not necessarily favor it, uh, could even oppose it. I oppose it. I oppose uh, drugs. So I regard you uh, more of a libertarian than a conservative, although you came from conservative roots, just as I came from leftist roots. Well, let me ask you this. Um, so first of all, I can relate to your kind of picking and choosing from the Ayn Rand project, you know, her whole, I don't agree with everything in her, you know, her epistemology, obviously her atheism, you know, William F. Buckley was pretty fierce against her throughout everything. And I just said, no, I'm not going to throw out, I'm going to, as they would say, eat the meat, spit out the bones, you know, I'm going to, and I think there, that she was a colossal benefit to people in the 20th century, because you, you know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but here you have, you know, the Great Depression hits in uh, late 20s, early 30s, and then you have collectivism, you have FDRs, whatever that is, he has this, uh, you know, New Deal thing going on there, and pretty much people are just trusting in the government for to make, meet their basic needs, you know, the, the shift goes on from the kind of like a self-sufficiency then all of a sudden ayn rand comes up comes out of nowhere really and is speaking a completely antithetical message that we don't need the government to meet our basic needs and as much as william buckley was a opponent of ayn rand i th i think he had some re re residual he absorbed some of the residual you know uh critique of big government from ayn rand and i i just think it's wonderful i mean i don't I'm not ever going to buy into her atheism. I think it's ridiculous, you know, but for me, what I, I just strongly, strongly uh, agree with is that we need to be self-sufficient. We don't need to be dependent upon the government if, if at all possible, you know, basically uh, you become a slave to the government. If you, if you pretty much put your trust in meeting your basic needs. And I, I just, uh, I respect her in many ways. She was kind of like a, a revolutionary uh, in a sense, because she's just saying the complete opposite of what, you know, the status quo, basically trust in the government. You know, we, you know, she's, a, she's a basic exact opposite of Bernie Sanders worldview, the democratic socialist worldview. And it, it's a beautiful thing to me. And so much, some of my friends go, why would you want to talk to, you know, a person who doesn't believe in Christ? And I said, well, hey, listen, man, whether or not he believes in Christ or not, he wants the, the ga gas prices to be a lot lower. He doesn't, I mean, he did what do you want, $10 gas prices now? I mean, so, so I appreciate you. I appreciate Ayn Rand so much. Um, so let's get into some of the basic issues of libertarianism, Walter. Um, so in a nutshell, when you we talk about libertarian economics and you're talking about the, the Austrian school, explain to us the Austrian school of economics. I know that was like a uh, Mises. And then also who was the guy that wrote the, um, the road to serfdom of uh, Van Hayek. Hayek. Yeah. Were they, were they similar in their views Hayek and Mises or, or is, first of all, explain what the Austrian school of economics is or was and Explain the, uh, the similarities and differences between Hayek and um, Mises' worldview on economics. Well, before I do that, let me just comment on, on what you previously said. Um, 
uh, I'm an atheist, but to me, uh, you see, Ayn Rand was, how shall I say it, a vicious atheist or a, a rabid atheist or something like that. Uh, you know, if you believed in God, you were a jerk or, or something like that for her. You were an idiot. Uh, I don't have that view. And uh, I, I, uh, I'm a pro-religious atheist. Why am I a pro-religious atheist? Because the enemy of uh, the main enemy of uh, libertarianism is um, is communism. And how did communism treat religion? <laughs> Not too well. And I go by the view that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And what you have is two institutions that are vying for the hearts and minds of the people. And one of them is religion and one of them is uh, is uh, communism. And, and which is worse? Well, communism has killed millions of people. How many how many people is religion killed? Very, very few. You, know, you had the um, uh, what was that in the Middle Ages um, uh, uh, where they killed a non -believer? Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition. Inquisition. How many people did the Inquisition kill over four centuries? 3,000, 4,000, something like that. Very, very few. Whereas uh, uh, government has killed, you know, millions, of, billions of people. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Uh, I regard religion as my friend, even though I'm an atheist, because they are way better than government uh, in terms of innocent people killed, very few. And um, therefore, I'm, I'm pro-religion. But I'm, I don't believe in God, but I, I uh, support religion. Look, I'm a, I'm a professor at Loyola University, which is a Jesuit school. If I were really uh, adamantly uh, opposed to religion, I, I don't think I could do that. So uh, that would be my view. As for Buckley, uh, he had some, he was very good on economics, but he was a little bit too much of a warmonger for my taste. And now you mentioned Bernie Sanders and Rand Paul. And Bernie Sanders is pretty good on foreign policy. He's anti-war. He is not a, a big warmonger. Uh, actually, he and Rand Paul, your buddy Rand Paul, got together on uh, the two of them, you know, uh, what do they call it? A marriage of st strange bedfellows or something like that. Uh, Bernie Sanders and Rand Paul cooperated with each other. They're both senators. I think they both pr promoted something, uh, some opposition to some U.S. imperialistic war. So you get uh, great complications. I'm, I'm sort of interested in, in you saying that you like Rand Paul better than Ron Paul. Uh, let me interview you. Let me turn the tables on you. Uh, what What is it that, that, that um, and I will answer this the question about um, uh, Austrian economics, but I was just curious, uh, why, what about Ron Paul uh, uh, makes you uncomfortable? Um, I think it could also be a generational thing. Um, it may be just an approach to it's not so much content it's approach you know obviously uh i uh listened to ron paul and i think he got a bad a bad deck of cards he was dealt a bad deck of cards by mitt romney there in uh 2012 there's a good case that i'm not saying that ron paul would have won the nomination that was a you know so it would definitely some of the disciples of ron paul influenced me um, to me, uh, maybe Rand Paul is a little more distilled, you know, more distilled in his views, you know, more, I guess, just to be able, you know, not full concentrate, you know, and I really got behind him, you know, the tea party, you know, 2010 when he came to, you know, became the Senate, you know, the U S Senate there out of Kentucky and just, uh, and just the way he, I followed his career. It could have been more like a fanboy kind of thing, more than just ideology. I, I just kind of got behind it. Um, I came later in life to the libertarian kind of, well, at least I had, I had some, some libertarian views, but Rand Paul just made sense when he was articulating for me, what I really liked about Rand Paul was when he was speaking out against the uh, anti-surveillance state and that, he actually worked with uh, Bernie Sanders on that issue. Just I didn't like being spied on. You know, some of the issues that were, you know, by that time, Ron Paul had retired from Congress, right? And Rand Paul's there in, in the U.S. Senate fighting these issues of, about the debt. And, and obviously, Ron Paul had been doing that for years. 
But here's Rand Paul doing filibusters in the Senate, you know, in prime time and speaking out against surveillance. Um, so I guess I, I just connected in some way with Rand Paul and not a way that I did with Ron Paul. I don't know if it was speaking style. Just Rand Paul just made a lot more, I guess, something about the package that Rand Paul was presenting just clicked with me a little bit more than Ron Paul, but nothing, it wasn't like an ideological thing. I mean, I think that Ron Paul is a tremendously important person in the history of politics in America. Um, yeah, well, I, I think that Ayn Rand for my generation and Ron Paul for your generation, you're a bit younger than I am, uh, are the two people that have uh, created more libertarians than any other two people. Uh, maybe Milton Friedman comes in third in terms of numbers of people converted. Um, Mises and Rothbard were more um, uh, intellectual. Well, uh, they, the others were intellectual. They didn't have as big a megaphone, uh, and they had a, a profound uh, importance on libertarianism. But in terms of numbers of converts, I, I think that it would be uh, uh, Friedman would come in third and, and Rand and um, Ron Paul would come in first and second. Uh, I have to tell you um, two stories about me and Rand Paul before I answer the question about Austrian economics. Uh, one uh, is that there was a libertarian conference out in, um, oh, what's that city? N not Las Vegas. What's the second biggest city in Phoenix? Uh, sorry? Phoenix, Arizona, or, or, or in Nevada? In Nevada. What's the second biggest city in Nevada? Reno. Reno. The libertarians had a conference in, in Reno. And uh, everybody had to pay a hundred bucks to enter or something like that. And then if you wanted a special session with Ron Paul, it was like 500 uh, extra. If you wanted a special se uh, session with Rand Paul, it's 300. And if you wanted a special session with me, you had to pay a hundred. So uh, I, I was like uh, one of the big three, uh, the smallest of the big three, but one of the big three. Uh, the other Rand Paul story I have to tell is um, the New York Times once interviewed me uh, when Rand, I think this was in 2015 when Rand was a, a good candidate to become the president of the United States. And uh, I didn't realize what they were doing, but it was sort of a hit piece on Rand Paul. And the hit piece was Rand hangs around with a bunch of idiots and look at these idiots and therefore Rand is besmirched by these idiots. Oh, I was one of the 12 idiots and they were interviewing me about um, what is libertarianism? And I was, you know, giving them this and that freedom and, and all, and they weren't getting it. So I give them the A-bomb and the A-bomb is voluntary slavery. If my son, God forbid, has uh, got a horrible disease and uh, the only way to cure him is $20 million and I don't have $20 million and you're Bill Gates and uh, you're willing to pay me $20 million to give to my son and uh, then I'll become your slave. Uh, is this a valid contract? And I said, yeah, it's a valid contract. It's voluntary. So you know what these rascals did? <laughs> <laughs> they quoted me as favoring actual slavery. So I, I sued them for, uh, I don't know, uh, whatever, libel, slander, whatever. And uh, we settled out of court. But th that's my Rand Paul, my second Rand Paul story. Now I'm ready to finally answer your question. What is Austrian economics all about? Uh, you have your mouth open. <laughs> do you, do you want to oh, talk listening. about this before? No, before I'm, we... just, I'm listening. To, I'm, I'm, you know, obviously we've rubbed shoulders with some of the same people and I'm just trying to put it all together. And, you know, something that I know is this, an interesting uh, tidbit in history is that uh, Mick Jagger of the, of the Rolling Stones, a lot of people don't know this, but he went to the London school of economics before he made it big. I'm not sure if he ever graduated from there, but he at least went a year or two to, uh, the London School of Economics. And what there, there was a professor, what Lasky, I think Lasky was, I think he was like a pretty much a socialist. And then John F. Kennedy and his older brother who was killed in World War II um, spent some time at the London School of Economics. And at that time, from if you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, that's when uh, you had uh, Mises and uh, um, Hayek were teaching at the same time as Lasky, but a radically different view, right? Yeah, Hayek, Hayek was in England. Um, Mises was, I think, in um, Gestad. Um, 
and Mises was running away from the, the Nazis and um, Hayek was around there. Uh, so let's talk about Austrian economics since we're mentioning uh, Mises and Hayek. Uh, Austrian economics has nothing to do with the economics of the country Austria. The reason it's called Austrian economics is because the creators of it were all from Austria. Um, uh, Bamba Werk, um, Menger, Mises, Hayek, they all were uh, from Austria and they had a distinctive school. It's sort of like the Chicago School of Economics. It's got nothing to do with the city Chicago. It's just that uh, Friedman and Stigler and Becker were all at the University of Chicago. So that's why it's called the Chicago School of Economics. Uh, so what does the, um, uh, the Austrian School of Economics stand for? Well, um, uh, we Austrians, I'm an Austrian economist, have a different view of the business cycle. The, the mainstream, uh, uh, the right wing mainstream uh, believes in monetary policy. The left wing uh, mainstream, uh, the, the Keynesians believe in fiscal policy. But they both believe that the uh, economy is, um, uh, how shall I say it, um, veers into uh, either inflation or uh, depression. And we Austrians diverge from both of those people. And we say, no, no, the free enterprise system is not going to be inflationary nor unemployment. Uh, uh, we have such a thing called stagflation, which I think refutes both of them. The idea uh, of the Keynesians is that when you have a depression, you have uh, you pump up the economy and, and the um the Chicagoans say when you have a depression, you pump it up with monetary policy. And uh, what about stagflation? That, then you, you have both uh, problems. So uh, we diverge from them on business cycles. We diverge from them on antitrust. Uh, the mainstream uh, view, and even the Chicagoans, uh, who are supposedly free enterprise, believe in antitrust, and we um, um, uh, Austrians do not. Perhaps the most significant um, difference between the Austrian school and the mainstream uh, economists are uh, more um, meta-economics, uh, namely uh, uh, the mainstream believes in um, empiricism. They believe that there are no such things as um, economic laws. There are only hypotheses. And uh, like, let's say a, a hypothesis like the minimum wage creates unemployment for unskilled workers. Uh, the left wing uh, the left wing economists wouldn't go along with that. They, they Card and Kruger think the minimum wage law uh, creates um, uh, raises wages, but the Chicagoans uh, believe that that it doesn't that that it does create unemployment for unskilled workers, but they believe that it's not an economic law. You have to test these things. Namely, they have physics envy or or chemistry envy, and in the hard sciences there are no laws. Uh, there are just hypotheses that are that haven't been refuted yet. Uh, sometimes, you know, water might run uphill, who knows, but right now <laughs> water keeps running downhill. We have gravity. But but if water ran uphill, it would not be a logical contradiction. Whereas for the Austrians, we believe uh, that economics is not really a branch of uh, empirical science. It's rather a branch of logic. And we start off with uh, certain premises like human beings act. Uh, which are irrefutable because if you try to refute it, you're engaging in, in human action. And we believe that there are certain laws and you can only, uh, you can illustrate these laws with econometric um, empirical uh, techniques, but you can't test them. Uh, like take the, 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 the claim, um, I don't know, you have that nice hat, you're wearing a nice hat. You bought that hat for 30 bucks. Uh, I say as an Austrian economist, um, you, when you um, uh, bought that hat, you were trying to improve your situation. And the reason you bought the hat is because you valued it at more than 30 bucks. And therefore, um, ex ante, you made a profit. Let's say you valued it at 50 bucks and you paid 30 bucks. Well, you made a profit of 20 bucks. And I say that that's irrefutable, not the numbers, but the idea that you gained a, a profit when you bought that hat. 
And the the mainstream people would say, well, you know, we have to test that. We, we you know, that's cultish, that's um, religious. And here they don't mean religious in a positive way. They mean in a cultish way that somehow we have to test the idea that you made a profit when you bought that hat. And Austrians say, oh, no, no, no. Uh, ex now, ex post, you might regret it. Who knows? The hat's not stylish. Uh, maybe you're not making a profit now off of it. But when you bought it, you gain. Now, I had a, a little dispute with my uh, dissertation advisor, Gary Becker, who was a Chicagoite. This is when he was at Columbia. He was my mentor and, and my dissertation advisor. And I was doing a, uh, a study of rent control. And my thesis was, if you have rent control, uh, housing will be worsened. And I had a you know two-stage least squares um, uh, econometric uh, uh, equation set. And most of the times, so I would get the right uh, sign, namely the more rent control, uh, the worse housing. And I would usually get it statistically significantly. But every once in a while, I would screw up and I would get the wrong sign. It would be statistically significant, showing that rent control was great. It was helping, uh, holding constant everything else you could think of, like weather and, and wealth and uh, crime and whatever might impact the quality of housing. And what Gary, my thesis is that if you scratch a good economist, and he was a good economist, but not an Austrian, you'll find an Austrian. And what he said to me when I when I showed him uh, the, the bad results, he said, Block, go out and do it again till you get it right. So what was testing what? Were, were my crappy econometric equations testing the primordial uh, basic um, premise that rent control screws up housing? No, it was the other way around. The, the reality was testing my, my, uh, my, my empirical work and showing that sometimes my empirical work was correct and sometimes it wasn't. But I wasn't testing this. I was just illustrating it. So this would be a, a gigantic difference uh, between the two. So, Walter, um, I hate to tell you this, but believe it or not, we're closing on uh, over 35 minutes of time. We, we're going to want to have you come back this, this fall, if you, if you don't mind. I'm, I'm going to have a longer I'm going to try to see if we can do this a little longer. I don't want to cut you off. Um, I want you to save that. We're going to talk about, econ uh, you know, um, Austrian economics. But before we go here, I want you to uh, just give me a, a, a view of libertarian freedom. You mentioned that. That's the most appealing of all your, what you've said today about freedom, about liberty. But what, what, what is a, what's the libertarian view on freedom? Like what, why does it produce freedom for people? Well, libertarian is really a theory of what is just law. And it's only it's not a theory of what's right. Take prostitution. I'm against prostitution. I, I wouldn't want my mother, my, my wife, my daughter <laughs> to be a prostitute. But if they were, I wouldn't want them to go to jail for it because it's between consenting adults. So libertarianism is just a theory of law. It's a very narrow theory. It's not a theory of life. It's not a theory of uh, how you should live. It just says you should live in, in such a way that you don't initiate violence against anyone else. And then you're on your own. Uh, so to me, the beauty of libertarianism is its narrowness. It's, it's very limited. It only says what is just law. And just law is no murder, no rape, no theft, no kidnapping, because that would be an initiation of violence against innocent people. Uh, you know, I'd be delighted to come on your program again. And, and one of the issues that's very prevalent now, which we don't have time to discuss now, is um, abortion. How do you apply libertarianism to abortion? Is it a violence? Again, when does the baby start? Uh, so I'd be delighted to be on your show again and, and talk about uh, libertarianism and Austrian economics again. Um, Walter. You're highly loved by me and my friends. We're going to have you back on this fall. Uh, have a great uh, start of the new semester. Uh, thank you so much, and we'll talk to you soon. And this has been the Lee Enoch Show, America's most controversial podcast, signing out. Remember, we speak the truth in love. God bless you.